Thanks for selecting this course. And my first question to you, why did you do it? I mean, if I would be you, and I was a student like you many years ago, and I had something like this, a number of courses which were about stuff like this, and I really didn't like them. So that's why I'm a bit curious, why do you guys now, if you're so young and you probably are programmers, because my understanding when I was young, I, I didn't know why all of this was necessary, this uh, automatas, uh, form, uh, this for grammars, formal semantic, all of this stuff was quite boring, and I didn't see the relevance between this science and um, uh, the actual programming which I was doing. I have to admit, I still don't see it always. I still see that the programming we do, the code we write, the languages we use, and the formal stuff, stuff which people tell us, which people teach us, all this scientific stuff, they are a little bit disconnected. I mean, the science is something pure, something interesting in, in, in the formulas, but when you write code, you don't see where is the science. In the code, it's not so visible. So that's why I decided to do the course. I decided to, uh, to show you how this stuff can be applied in practice. So every lecture will organize like this. Half of the lecture, I will give you some formal stuff, which you need to know, but I will not go deeper because, first of all, I don't think it's important to everybody. And second, I'm not really good at it. I'm more practical programmer. I write code. I don't really write scientific papers that as much as I write code. And uh, number three, probably, like I said, because you can do it yourself later if you want, but you, mo most of you will not need it. Most of you will be enough. The information which I will give you, with most of you will be enough to understand what's going on. So the most interesting part will be in the second part of the lecture. The most boring part will be in the beginning of the lecture. And today we're going to have two lectures. The first lecture will be about formal uh, grammar what it is, and probably some of you have heard that from previous courses. I was told that uh, you were taught this, so that's why I will try to be short and down to the point. And the second lecture will be about uh, syntax analysis, which is, in my opinion, will be more fun, more interesting, and I will show you more practical examples how we do it in our real projects. The formal grammar. We deal with programming languages. Either we make programming languages, for other people, or we use programming language. The language is something that the computer has to understand. So we have to write it the way we understand, the computer has to read it the way computer understands it. For the computer to understand it, it needs to parse this, the, the text, any programming language, any program in the language is basically a text. So symbols, symbols, and symbols. So they, the programmer, the, the, the programmer, the compiler and the programmer, they both need to read it, but the compiler has to read it in a structured way, in a formal way. So the compiler cannot be intuitive. The compiler, you understand, it's obvious things I'm saying. So we need to uh, formalize the language. We need to say that the language is possible to, uh, the language may look like this. And now I'll try to show you a really simple program. So imagine we have a programming language, which looks like this. It's very old language from the old days. The first line says, 10, the line number 10, oh, let's, let's make it even more simple. The first line says print number 42. The second line says print number zero. The third line says exit. So can we write an analyzer, let's say parser, analyzer, whatever, some program which will read this text and do what the text says? Do you really need some formal grammar for this? Do you need some formalization? Some form I don't think you do. How would you do it? Let's say, forget all this science, and how would you do it? You need to read this text from me and understand every line and do what I say. The only two commands, print and exit, and print follows with the number. How would you do it? Exactly. By the end of each line, we have an end of line here, end of line here, and probably end of line here. So first of all, we do just to take it as a, a long text, and then we just split this text into, two, into three pieces, and then each piece will be split into, there's a space here, will be split into, no, that's wrong, into two, into two parts. The command and the argument. You don't need any formalization here. Just split, split, split. So they're basic string operations string manipulation operations. And I can say that in most cases, that's enough. In most cases. Actually, I have my own project, which uh, is, um, I'll show you a little bit later today, which is uh, 
a common line, it's not a common line, but it's, a, it's an instrument for manipulating of XML documents. So usually when you deal with XML documents, when you want to modify XML documents, you maybe know how difficult it is. So who faced that problem ever in your projects? So you, you did some, in which languages? For Android, so it's Java. Yeah, so you know that in order to, let's say, remove one element from the XML document, you need to write in Java maybe like 10 or maybe 15 lines of code. So it's not just one line. And that was annoying for me all the time, you know, in most of the projects I do. So I created a simple, a simple library, which uh, is, uh, so you, you give this library, this library is called basically assembly. Assembly. So you give this library as an input, an XML document, and a program written in a language which I invented. A very simple. And then in the, as an exit, you get a new document, XML Prime, the modified one. So let me give an example of a, of a program in this programming language. You can do like this. Who knows what is XPath? So it's basically XPath, it's, you need to know that as a programmer. It's basically a, a, a way to specify the location of an element inside XML document. So if you have this XML document, who knows what is XML? Everybody, all right. So let's say this is the, the, the XML document, let's say car, and this uh, price, and then it's the 5,000. And then the end of the price, I'm not gonna write it here, and the end of the car. So let's say we want to modify the price from 5,000 to 2,000. So XPath can give us, first of all, we can find the place where the price is. So we can say XPath, that's my language. XPath and you say slash car, slash price, and that's it. So you move like a, a cursor, like a, like a place in the document into this position, into, the, into this element. So now the cursor is here. And then the second, and then you put this, and then the second command is set 2000. That's it. So you, you feed this program to the assembly machine, and you feed this document to the assembly machine, it just does the manipulations, and boom, you get a new XML document. Pretty easy, right? So look at this language. The command goes first, then the space, the mandatory space, and then the argument, and then sometimes it takes a number of arguments. For example, you can say, uh, sometimes you can say, uh, I'm trying to, re yeah, sometimes you can say this. One command takes two arguments. You can say attribute. Let's say here for the price, we, can, we want to add, for the price, we want to add an extra attribute and say the price for today. And then we say yes. So what the command will do, it will turn our price into, into this. Price today equals yes. But the rest will be unchanged. So it's going to be 5,000 here, and the price will be closed like this. So there are two commands. But that's basically it. That's the entire syntax of the language. But in order to implement this, this assembly tool, I used the formal grammar, which I feel guilty for because it's slow because all the formalism and all the proper parsing all the proper pro processing of the code takes time and I am planning to get rid of this formal grammar and get rid of the proper parsing with the, everything which I'm going to teach you today and, and on these two lectures and just get back to string pro processing because it's so easy look at this look at what happens look at what I need to do I need first of all to take this line then break first of all break all the lines by the semicolon I get all the commands, and then each command will start, for sure will start with the, with the, um, um, with the name of the command, then it's gonna be a space, or maybe a number of spaces, and then argument, comma, argument. The only problem which may happen for me is that, is in this case. Now I'm getting to why we need more, more professional, more detailed approach. Let's say the command is this. Uh, I'm saying set, so before it was set 2000, but instead of this, I do this command, set hello world. So this is easy. You just split it, like we said, by space, and then we see the 
the, where this starts, these, these two uh, quotation marks, they start and, and finish the, the text. And we take, we take the text between these uh, quotation marks. And if the argument, if the second argument goes after that, with the comma, I don't know, something else, then we uh, separate the arguments with the comma. But what can we do in this case? The comma stays inside the text. So we cannot treat this as the first argument and this is the second argument. Because we need to understand somehow that this together is one argument. And here the magic starts. Here you can stop, you, you basically cannot deal anymore with easy, with simple uh, you know, string processing and splitting the text into strings. You need to do something more advanced. And this is how these formal grammars come into place and then we need proper parsers and then we need proper syntax analyzers and, and that's it. So that's what I wanted to, to say why we need it. So in most cases you don't, but sometimes you do. So grammar is, uh, as they say, a formal grammar is, uh, the formal definition is that the formal grammar is a finite set of rules for generating syntactically, syntactically correct sentences, for generating. So they say, in the formal definition of a grammar, they say, you know, a grammar is a bunch of rules which say, you know, uh, let's say, let's, let's do it first informally. Let's say our rule is this. Um, when you say print, after the print, you can only put a number. And if you say exit, you don't see anything, you don't say anything after the exit. And after each command, you put the semicolon. So these are informal rules. If you look at these rules and call these rules a grammar, then from these rules, you can generate any legal sentence in our programming language. I mean, specifically generate, not get back, but generate. That's, that's how they define formal grammar. That's the, that's the proper definition, the generate. So by looking at the grammar, you say, yeah, I can write this, or I can write this, or I can write, and then it's a probably infinite set of this of these uh, sentences, right? Because you can say many, many in the numbers is infinite set of infinite infinite set of numbers, so you can generate many, many sentences from these grammatic rules. And, um, and now let me show you. Probably I close the microphone here. Now let me show you. how scientists define the grammar. So they say that the grammar is a quadruple or four tuple. And this four tuple, if this is the grammar, then the four tuple, you know what is tuple? Okay, good. So uh, it includes four elements. First, uh, sorry. Four elements. So the element first is a set of so-called non-terminals. And non-terminals include things which, or a better even name is variables. The things that at the moment of writing uh, the grammar, as far as I understand it, we cannot say exactly what they are, how exactly they look. For example, in our program, in our magic language, we can say it's gonna be uh, command Oops. It's going to be a command, or it's a set, or it's going to be a number. Let's say this is the full possible elements in our language. Remember the language, print number, print number, and then exit. So basically, we, we have commands and we have numbers. And then they have a set of terminals. The terminal is something specific which is not a variable, but more like an alphabet. They say it's an alphabet of our programming language. So let's say in our alphabet there is a number 10, the number which we can print, or a number 45, or 42, or maybe a number, I don't know, 1000, or the command exit, or the command print, and so on. So if this is it, if that's the full stop, then our language will understand this amount of so-called terminals. 
Now I'll put it all together, you will see how it works. Then the P is the number, an, a, a set of production rules. Production rules. Production rules. They are the rules which are saying the same as we said before, but in a more, uh, you know, in a more strict way. And S is where do we start? So where the parser should start? So what is the non-terminal? The S belongs to the set of N. So S is, what is the non-terminal? What is the variable which defines the entire program? So probably this definition is not right. We need one more terminal, which is say program. And here S, in our case, would be program from here. Usually they use, in, in, in when they describe grammars, they use just, just, um, just uh, capital letters for here. So instead of the command, number, and program, you can, you can find uh, the definition which will look like this. Command, num number, and, and program, C and P, for sure. Sometimes they may give you a different letters here. I've seen, instead of N, T, P, S, they say uh, V here because of variables. They said sigma here because of I don't know what. Uh, they say R here because of rules, and S usually is this, always the S. Doesn't matter, you can use any letters you want. So now let's try to write the simplest, the simplest, the simplest rules for our programming language. Remember the language, we have print uh, one, and we have exit, and these things, they stay together, let's say maybe like this. With the, with the semicolon. In this case, if we put semicolon here, we need to add semicolon to the alphabet. So semicolon is also, mem is also part of the alphabet. Actually, I will you will see it later today that uh, in a proper, in, in, when you really define the proper parser, then in the alphabet you also include, sometimes you may need, you need to include spaces, like end of lines or the space. Also, they are members of the alphabet because when you type, you type the space, you type the end of the line. So these are the elements of the alphabet. But sometimes people skip that and just assume that the parser just dropped these elements and don't, don't pay attention to them. So print one and exit. So how do we define the rule? Let's define the simplest one. We say that the program P is, they say it generates, uh, is a, uh, the command, and after the command goes the number, and then goes the semicolon. We can put it here, like a, like a, like a, like an element of the alphabet. And then we say, okay, what is C? The C may be uh, print. Also. A terminal, or let's do that. Or C, maybe the exit. What is the N? The N may be ten, or the N may be forty-two. Yeah, exit doesn't have a number. That's right. So this one is not going to work. Okay. So in this case, we say that P. Yeah, actually it's not right here because P, in this case the program will have only one command. If we do it like this, then we basically say here that the program has only one command, one number, semicolon, and that's it, end of the story. So the definition of the program is not right. We need to do it definite, definitely, differently. We say, this is more or less okay. So we say the program is, uh, let's say a line semicolon, a line, and then semicolon, line, and so on and so forth. In order to not write all of them there, people use recursion. So we can say, uh, we can say the program is a line plus a program, or the program is, they say, epsilon how to write correctly. So it's empty, basically nothing. So let's, let's look at this in this way. So let's say the program has no text, then this rule, rule matches. 
If the program has just one line, then it's okay. The program is one line, F and the semicolon. If the program has two lines, then the program is one line, semicolon, and again, the program, it's a line and the semicolon. So in this case, we can see any program. A program will be a collection of line after line after line. With these two rules, we define recursively because we look at, we, we refer to itself in this rule. So this is called recursion in this case. In this case. Uh, we recursively refer to itself. Sometimes people write it even more compact. You can say, instead of creating two rules, you can make it like this, with the vertical bar, and then you say that the epsilon stays here. So it means that the program is either this or this, and this is empty. That's the, the, gener the rule that generates the program. Now let's take a look at the line. So in the line, we may have a command, and then the space, well, we don't say the space here, but we assume that the space is there, so we say command, and after command, we have the number. And the semicolon is there, so we don't mention it here. So the command and the number, but some lines, they have only the command. So we, ha we have this just only the command. So these two rules also will allow us to parse anything in our language. The, the print 42 will, will be matched by this rule. The print, the, the exit will be matched by this rule. But it's not perfect. So this, the way we define this is far from being perfect. I'm just giving you now the, the feeling of what, what, what's going on. But this is ambiguous, it's not deterministic, so there are all many, many things wrong with this grammar. But it works. I mean, it, it, it's good enough to describe our primitive language. In general, okay, I'll show you this formula, which is, which says how, in general, a rule may look. So they say that the rule, this production rule, has two parts with the arrow here. On the left part, we can put uh, terminals or a terminal or not terminal as many as we want, or maybe zero. Then we put one non-terminal, and then again, terminal or non-terminal, as many times as we want. On the right side, we have to say, we have to put a terminal or non-terminal, again, as many times as we want. Let's look at our rule on the top. The line is a command or a number. Or another rule. The program is epsilon, empty. So on the first, the first rule here, L is a non-terminal. These, these two guys are skipped. We don't have them on this first rule. Here we have the C is a non-terminal, N is, in our case, N is a number. So it's also a non-terminal, so that's okay. The second rule is well, P as well, it's a non-terminal, and epsilon means that we are empty. So there is nothing, we don't have anything on the right side. But it's okay to have, to have nothing on the right side. What is not allowed in, in these formal grammars is to have epsilon on the, on the left side. So this is illegal. Everything else is legal so far. Now we'll go, di now we'll go deeper and we'll see that these formal grammars, this, this, the way these rules are formulated, are categorized into four groups. So you can make, you can start from like we have now. Now we have unrestricted, non-restricted, it's unrestricted, un unrestricted grammar, so-called. So there are no restrictions. You can put whatever you want on the right side and, uh, well, whatever you want on the right side. And on the left side, there's only one restriction that uh, the non-terminal, this capital letter, something which we call a variable, is present on the left side. That's enough. So all of this, by the way, was introduced in 1956, if I'm not mistaken, by Noam Chomsky. That's the guy, so the guy who introduced that. And he suggested to classify grammars into four categories. Type 0, type 1, type 2, type 3. Maybe you've heard about that. So type 0, we just we just discussed. This is unrestricted grammar. Then he said, okay, the next is um, so-called uh, context-sensitive grammar. The context-sensitive grammar, how I understand it, is that a grammar in which 
the number of elements on the left side of this arrow and the number of, let's say here we have N, P, I don't know, L, the, 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 I don't know, the, uh, we can have anything here. We can have a semicolon here. We can have uh, 22 here. These are the terminals. And these are the non-terminals. And then we have something else. And on the right side, we have, uh, again, maybe N, P, and then again, 22. And then instead of X, we say uh, it's going to be uh, hello and some A. So we basically replaced X with this. You see, this is what happened. So the rule basically extended, enlarged the left part from X to two elements. We had just one non-terminal, and here we have non-terminal and terminal. Uh, the other way around. We have a terminal and non-terminal. So type, Z, type one grammars, or as they call it, context-sensitive grammar, or as they call it, non erasing grammar is the grammar which guarantees that on the left side we have at least the same amount uh, on the right side we have at least the same amount of elements as on the right as on the left side so here if we have if we say we have um, five elements and here we have six elements so they say that the six will always more or equal to five so we're not going to erase elements so we go from small to large we are non erasing grammar and that gives us some features, because we have that, we have some features. Uh, the basic the feature is that this grammar is so-called monotonic. So it only will monotonically go in one direction. So it will eventually stop parsing our code. But if this rule is not guaranteed, then we may parse endlessly. What this means? It means nothing. It's just an example. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, I'm just... It's just random, random set of non-terminals and terminals, and then on the right side again. Some it's it's not for our language. It's just to show you the idea of what is non-erasing. So let's say in in the I can give you an erasing uh, uh, and this is non-erasing. I'll give you the erasing example from our language. Let's say, uh, let's say we have uh, on the left side maybe command and the number, and we say that this is. Maybe like this. So this is erasing. So on the left side, we had two variables, and we say that they, it goes to only one non-terminal. What it means in reality, how it's going to be, what, what is the meaning of that? It's hard to imagine for me. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe this is possible. Instead, we can say, Let's do it this way. Let's say we have a command print. Print n. So this is the terminal, and n is non-terminal. So we say print some number, and then we reduce it to uh, uh, I don't know some command stop. So in this case, people write the, the program, which says print. 10, and the parser says that this command actually is, I understand it as stop. I understand it as stop. What does it mean? Well, it, it can be, we can write a parser like this, which will read it and will just understand it as stop, but that's going to be not con it's going to be the the grammar which is not even uh, type one it's going to be type zero i don't know we don't do it it's it's something it's something from the you can learn it yourself we in in reality we don't use that we use type two which is context-free grammar so this context sensitive grammar uh they are an and unrestricted grammar it's only for for scientists in my opinion in reality we use context-free grammar or regular grammars the type two and type three so type two is type two. It's called context-free grammar. Context-free grammar uh, because uh, for the context-free grammar, the rule is even more restrictive than the previous one. And the rule says that on the left side of the of the production rule, 
uh, on the left side, here's the left side, this is the right side. So on the left side, we are allowed to have only one, only one non-terminal. So like in, our, like in our grammar before. You see, we have the only one, only one non-terminal. One, 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 always. On the left side, stays only one non-terminal. This is called context-free grammar. Well, it's, it, has a prob it has problems on the right side, but on the left side, there are only um, single, single non-terminals. Why it's called context-free? Because the stuff which may stay around the non-terminal, they call context. So let's say we say, uh, we say, uh, like I said, the command uh, may be print or the command may be exit, the primitive way. But then we say, you know what? The print is accepted only if in the program, the print is okay only if after the print, goes the number. So the print and the, the command and the number, only in this case, we can parse it to, uh, to print and number. So context, so the, the command, some variable command, so we can, we can substitute the, 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 print, uh, the print terminal for the C if, uh, only after, only if, after the C goes M, which is the number. This is not context-free. This is context-sensitive. Context so in this case, the parser sensitive. In this case, the parser will not be able to understand this program. Uh, print and exit. So it will say, no, this is not clear to me because the number doesn't go after it. So I can understand print only if it goes together with the only if it stays together with the number. So it, it understands in the context. It understands the uh, certain non-terminal in the context which goes together with other things which stay on the left side of the rule. Does it make any sense? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> So we are, we, we are interested in context-free grammar. In context-free grammar, we just remove this stuff and we only deal, we just say, if you, if you see this, if you, uh, in order to, or if you see this, then it means this. If you see this, then it means this. Uh, but we don't say, if you see these together with something else, then you see that. It doesn't happen. So back to, <laughs> back to our language, to context-free grammars. Why do we need start symbol? Because the parser needs to know where is the, where is the, the beginning of the, of the program. So let's, let me give you an example again. So we, pro we will try to write the proper context-free grammar. So again, this is our language. It understands the command print uh, uh, something uh, like this. And then it understands some other command, maybe, I don't know, um, load one comma three comma five. So now we have uh, multiple arguments and it must understand exit. So this is the, this is the language. Uh, the, the, the scanner, first when it starts, when we start understanding what's there, when we, still, we take the, uh, the formal grammar and then we take the text which is given to us and we need to find the, find the place in the grammar. So let's write the grammar. So the grammar will be like this. Again, we say the program is like it was before. A program is either nothing or it is uh, a line, semicolon, and the program. Okay, this is the terminal. Then we say, what is the line? The line is uh, the command. Spaces we ignore. Okay, let's 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 do the proper way. So if we do it the proper, then we say semicolon and end of line. End of line and the program. Okay, two terminals. Then we say, what is the what is the command uh, the the line? The line is the command. After the command, we put spaces, any number of spaces. It's like the, the whatever any number of spaces you put there, it's going to be one terminal. And after that, okay, maybe you want it more strictly. So we okay, okay, it's going to be one space. Let's do one space. 
So we put one space after the C, and after that goes the collection of uh, collection of arguments. So we say it's going to be arguments. Okay, and then we specify what are the arguments. We say the arguments are, it could be, uh, let's say the number. Now I'm just showing the full picture, and then we'll reduce it to the proper rule. So it could be one number, or it could be a number with uh, two numbers, or it could be nothing if it's exit, or it could be number and number and number, and so on. So how do we define that in one rule? We're going to use recursion. So I would say we do it like this. We say, first of all, the arguments may be epsilon, so nothing. That's one option. The second option is that it is a number plus a tail. I, I would call it this way. And then the tail is either nothing or comma and then the number and then the tail. So let's try to decrypt this. So A is this. This is A. So we're trying to parse this A. And we say, in this case, it's also A. Here we also have A. And here we also have A. So they need to be parsed, three of them, by the same set of rules, by these two rules. So we say A is empty, fits for here. It's, it's okay for this place. If it's one argument, then it's okay for this rule. Set of arg the, the arguments are the number and the tail. The tail is empty. So the, comp so the A in this case with this tail is perfect for this option, for just one argument. If we have more than one argument, look at what happens. So in this case, the arguments is the number plus the tail, which is this. And this tail is recursively calling itself, which is the comma and the number again, and the tail again, which may be a comma and the number or nothing. So using these two rules, we can specify one, or I mean 10, or 12, or nothing, or 10, 7, or 7, I don't know, 18, 20. So all of these options will be parsed by these two rules recursively. It took me half an hour to, to create these rules, by the way. So it takes some time. Every time you think about formal grammar, you, it's not obvious. So if I ask you to do it immediately right now, you would not be able to create these rules just out of your head, unless you did it before. So it took me some time. I actually did it for, 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 for one of my real projects, when I need to parse uh, the, that, kind of, that kind of language. So this is how we use recursion in order to specify the rules for the parsing of the list of arguments. Okay? And... Uh, and now I'll show you how the so-called derivation process may be described. So let's say these are the rules we have, and I think that's it. That's all we need, right? Yeah, okay, we need to say what are the numbers, what are the terminals, but we don't say it here because we just assume that this, uh, we can only say maybe here that n is, uh, I mean, in our case, 10 or one or three or five or whatever. So this is kind of a, maybe that's the way to describe it. So usually people describe these terminals instead of making the rules for them. So we just say, that's, that's basically the grammar for the language. That's all we need. And now the derivation, derivation. Derivation. Derivation means that we take the, uh, take the, uh, the language, the, um, the text, this one, the, la the, the program, the something, the text, which is coming in, and we start uh, deriving the, uh, we, we try to turn this program into a stream of, of uh, a stream of terminals and non-terminals. So we need to break it down, this program, again, into stream of, yeah, into stream of terminals and non-terminals. And answering the question, uh, why we need the starting rule, starting rule, which is in our case is this, because otherwise, by looking at this text together, because it starts here and it ends here, together as a piece, we need to tell the parser what is it. 
Is it an argument? Is it a tail? Is it a number? So what to start with? And the parser doesn't know. So that's why we, we tell the parser, you know what, ignore everything else, just start from here. This is what, what we are giving you right now is P, is program. So start from here. Or maybe we can say, you know, it's a line. If it's a line, the parser will say, you know what, I see the command, I see the space, I see A, but then all of a sudden I see uh, uh, here an end of line, right? Because it's going to be the end of line after the first line. But I don't know what it is. So the parser will say that, no, it's not a line, it's something else. Because I see the three elements which are okay, but then something else happens and stop it. I cannot continue from here. So derivation looks like this. If we give numbers to these rules and say this is rule number, rule number one, two, three, four, and five, then the derivation of, let's say, let's make a simpler program. Let's say our program is print 10. That's it. That's the entire program. So we start from, we say, program, this symbol for derivation. And which rule we're going to use? We're going to use rule number one. For the rule number one, it is, which, which do we select? We select this part. So we say it is line, uh, the semicolon, and the end of line, and the P. This is our rule. Remember, we take this. And we say, our program is this. Then we continue. Maybe it's not good to say this is the rule number one. Let's say this is a rule number 1B, because this is part A, part B. So the rule one is actually two rules. We just write it like this with the vertical bar. But in reality, it's two rules. So when people say, uh, when, when we write like, I don't know, X, X, B, and then X, A, it's the same exactly the same as if we would write x, b, a. Just a, just a different notation. But in reality, there are two rules. So because of this, here we have two rules, the rule 1a and the rule 1b. So in this case, we apply rule 1b. Applying rule 1b, it fits because this is the program, this is the input, and this is the der derivation, derivation of the first the first stream of tokens, stream of, not tokens, let's not call yet the tokens, but stream of uh, terminals and non-terminals. Then the next one is probably 1A. We can say L, the same, the same, and P is perfectly substituted by epsilon. Nothing. Remember, rule 1A. P could be nothing. So we substitute P by nothing. The next derivation step, we have L semicolon end of line. L may be substituted by C space A. So we say C space A. And the rest stays semicolon, end of line, and epsilon. C space A semicolon. We just we just extend, you see what's going on. We just replace using, which rule did I use? The second rule, the rule number two. Next step, we see C space, and this is the program, remember? We're just looking at the program and we match. So we see, we, we look at this and we say print space, so this is our print space 10. So we can replace C with print. And we can say, instead of C, we say print. And then we say space, the same, A, semicolon, end of line, and epsilon. And which rule we used for that? We didn't have that rule, unfortunately. That's our mistake. So we need some kind of a rule. Let's say we have print, and we have the exit. So these are the rules. So this rule number six, and so on and so forth. We derive from the input, we derive, a so this is a stream of terminals. In the end, we want to get the stream of terminals. We, got, we want to get rid of the, all the variables. So there's a one, only one variable left, the variable A. So how do we deal with that? Again, the next derivation, again, we repeat the same stuff, space. But instead of A, what do we put? The A could be empty or the A could be number with the T. 
probably the rule 3b. 3b, instead of this, we pay number and the t, and again, the rest, and nothing. And here, the, probably the, not the final step, but one more step, we have ruled for the n. The n we can replace with 10. Space 10 here, the terminal, t, and dot line, and epsilon. The only variable which is left, which rule did we use for that? And we replaced with the number. That's the rule number five. And the final derivation step, we replace t with epsilon. That will be the derivation rule 4a. 4a. That's more or less how the derivation <laughs> works. Of course, we don't do it manually. It's just for understanding of how these variables are being replaced by non-variables, but non by, by terminals. Okay, and there is a symbol which uh, you can use, again, I don't know where, maybe in scientific papers where you explain how your grammar works. You can say that, you can, you can do it in one jump. You can say that P, uh, using the grammar G, in any possible jumps, immediately jumps to immediately derives to print, space, 10, and so on and so forth. So we just skip all the steps and we just immediately jump and say with, a, with certain application of, with some combination of the rule, because look at what happened. 1a, 2, 6, 3b, 5, 4a. So we use them differently, not in the specific order, but when it's possible. When it's possible to apply the rules, then we use them. And then this is the this is the operator which can, which can show that uh, this derivation happened in just one step, one long step. Okay. Yeah, it's, again, just scientific knowledge, but they say that um, it's, it's impossible to... Uh, it's impossible to understand if you look at the grammar and these rules and you look at another grammar, another set of rules, another grammar, to say that this grammar will, be, will, will, be, will generate exactly the same two languages or exactly the same language, not two, exactly the same language. So this problem is undecidable. So you cannot, make a, you cannot create an algorithm which will take two grammars and say whether they generate the same language or they are for different languages. So you cannot look at the formal description of Java language and the formal description of another, another formal description of Java language and say there's, they describe the same Java language. It's undecidable. Why? You can learn it yourself. Okay, and then the regular grammar. The regular grammar is the type 3 grammar. It's even more restrictive. So that was context-free grammar, and then there is a type 3 grammar, which is called regular grammar. Who knows regular expression? So this term, this, this name is coming from regular grammars. So regular expression is basically based on regular grammar. So regular grammar is uh, also the same, the grammar, where we have the left side and we have the right side. Uh, but we promise, if it's a regular grammar, then we promise that on the right side, we're going to have only one, only one non-terminal. Like, look at what happens here. Here we have multiple, like two non-terminals here, we have two non-terminals here, we have two here, so this is not a regular grammar. We have too many. So we need to rewrite it, if it's possible, so that on the right side of this arrow, always stay only one capital, capital letter, only one. It's, it's maybe difficult, but uh, if we do it, then we, get, uh, then, we get a, then we get a regular grammar. For example, I mean, maybe it's not, okay, there's a, so basically, there are, there are four options which you can have in a regular grammar. The option number one is you define it like this, A, epsilon. That's possible. Second option, you say A, some terminal. I don't know. Uh, print. The second option is you say A, uh, print, B, some, some variable. Or you, ha you, you say A, B print. So that's it. That's all you can do. So here you have it on the right. They call, they call it uh, right regular grammar. 
And this is left regular grammar. Of course, the easiest way to, to, to deal with grammars is with this one. So to create a parser, to create a computer which will read the, the grammar which you defined like this, that would be the easiest for you. Because if you deal with context-free grammar or even unrestricted grammar, then it will be extremely hard to create a parser. It will be a very sophisticated piece of software. For this case, it's easy. That's why regular expressions. So your regular expression is in this way. And uh, because of that, it's more or less easy to create a, a parser for regular expression. OK, now we need to discuss two more things, and I will show you the, the interesting piece of code. Uh, parse tree. What is parse tree? Parse tree is when you take a grammar, for example, this one, which you created. Let me copy it. Why? When? When? Where? When? When do you? If you start creating, uh, let's say, regular expression. Uh, yeah, let's let's create a regular expression. Hello. This is a regular expression, right? Or no? Well, in a plural style because of these two slashes, right? So the scanner which will parse, and this is the text for the regular, for the, for the scanner to parse. Hello, and comma, ja. Okay. Let's make it even more complex so you understand. Um, three names, and here the text is hello, Anna. So before working with this text, before working with this regular expression, the, 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 the compiler of the regular expression takes this expression and converts it into regular grammar. How would it look, this regular grammar? I think it will look like this. The entire text is either, is not either, is hello, it's a terminal, and then something like this. Uh, let's call it X. What is X? X is either Jeff, X is Peter, or X is Anna. This is regular grammar for this regular expression. Right? It is according to our rules. In the regular grammar, we may have only four rules. So we say T, hello. This is it. And then and T, sorry, this is the second. T, print, B. This is it. And then the, these three guys are of this way, of this format. That's it. So first we do the comp compilation. So you compile the regular expression into something like this internally inside your, compi inside your regular expression parser. And then looking at this, you start parsing this stuff. It's coming in, and you look, and then you do the, the, the derivation which we did before. You look, this is, the, this is the T, this is the T, so you look, okay, hello is here. So you break it down into terminals, non -term, the, same, the same process, derivation. These are regular expressions. And that's why uh, the, I, think, I think the regular expression is the name which showed up after they found out that they're regular grammars. They just needed some interesting way of uh, you know, scanning this small piece of text. So they said, okay, let's do it in them using regular grammars. How? That's how and they apply the regular grammars to, uh, to, to the development of a tool. Okay, so parse tree. What is the parse tree? So let's uh, copy our uh, parse tree. Is a visual graphic representation, graphical representation of the same derivation process as we've seen before. So if we take as an input, we take the program which is print ten. This is our text then the derivation tree will look like this. First, we'll look at the program, and we know, because of the starting rule is P, so we know that we start from P. We say this is P. And then we'll look, okay, we select the rule 1B, so we know that this is the line and the program. 
We break it down into two parts. So these are the parts, line and program. And between them, we have, sorry, it's like this. I forgot the terminals. So we break it down into, oops, break it down into four parts, line, semicolon, end of line, and a program again. This is our first step, first derivation. We find four elements going one, one after another. The P is epsilon, nothing. So we stop here. Here there are terminals, so we also stop. We don't continue. The L, we need to continue. The L in our case consists of three elements. The first element is our uh, command. The second element is the space. And the third element is the number. Then the command is print. The space is space, doesn't continue anywhere. And the number is 10. And then we can read, if by look at this, this is also the terminal. So we can read the entire result, the entire flow of tokens. Print, space, 10, semicolon, end of line. So we break down the entire text into the parse tree, or, also the, the, or else another name for this is con concrete syntax tree. Maybe, maybe you've heard about abstract syntax tree, but this is concrete syntax tree. So it only tells us about what is said there. It doesn't try to do any abstraction. It doesn't try to understand what's there. It's just a, just a straightforward uh, representation, visual representation of, uh, of a syntax. We know now by looking at this tree, we know exactly the main, the main goal of this parsing is to get the flow of, talk, of, the flow of terminals. We need to turn something which, we, which is coming to us as an input into a, street, into a sequence of terminals, one after another. When we have the sequence of, 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 street, of, uh, of these tokens, now we can deal with, um, well, not just the, not the, not the, in a line, in the, as a tree. So we want to see how they depend on each other. And by looking at this tree, we then can make decisions about what was said there. Yeah. Uh, say again. How? Yeah, for specific. So we say print ten, and this is the tree. If I do print something, if I do another program, it's going to be a different tree. So the tree is built on the input. So the tree is corresponds to the uh, to what was said here. To the inputs, to the input text. Yeah, the order matters, of course. How the tree is traversed and who will read the tree depends on the next step, depends on the syntax analysis. So when you, when you do this, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, so-called uh, lexical analysis. So we, we, uh, we only do the tokenization, so-called. So we turn the program into tokens, but we don't think about, uh, we don't, uh, I mean, no, the next step would be not the syntax. The next step would be trying to build abstract syntax tree to understand the meaning of all that. So far, we're only trying to understand the, the, the syntax. So what was said? It's like uh, I'm saying, uh, please open the window. So first we need to understand, please, open is a verb, the is an article, and window is a noun. That's enough. And then you try to understand the semantic. Okay, what did he say? He wants me to, so the computer then understands. Okay, now let's understand why the open stays next to the window. Probably they want me to open the window, to, to do this particular action. But first you break it down into syntactic constructs. The verb, the noun, the article, and how do you go after another. For example, if you say open window the, then the syntax analysis will just break and say it doesn't match because the should go before the window. Something like that. So at this step, we don't understand the program. We don't understand what it means. We only break it. We, don't, we only put it into parse tree. And the parse tree is, looks like this, usually. OK, two more things which we need to understand. First is ambiguity. It's very interesting. Ambiguity is important for real practical programming. Let me give you a real example. Let's say this is our uh, grammar. 
A, B, T. A, T, B. And B is T. So imagine there are three rules. And my, my entrance, my starting point is A. And now this text is coming, T, T. So the first rule says that uh, A could be, I mean, this is the starting point. A or A whatever, one of the A's. So the, 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 the first rule says that something goes first and the T goes next in my text. Something and then the T. The second rule says the T goes first, the letter. So this is the terminal. Terminal. So the T goes first and then something after that. And then this something is actually T. So if I enter this text as an input, let's try to build a syntax tree. So we start with an A because the starting point. So then we break it into two parts. If I take, I take, I mean, I, I let's, let's go there. I look at this text. I look at this, I'm a parser. I look at this uh, symbol and I see T, which rule is okay for me. The first one is okay. It's something and then the T. Something and the T. Yeah, good for me. B and then the T. Good enough. Then I look B. B is T. Yeah, also works for me. I parsed it well. How about I do it differently? I look at this from a different perspective. I say, I also start from an A. But I take the second rule. And the second rule, I say T goes first and T goes, stays here. So T works for me. And then something. And then T is a T and here is T. So I can turn this text into two equally correct grammar uh, syntax trees with this so-called ambiguous ambiguous grammar. So the grammar has ambiguity. It means that the parser is able to make the decision in, in, in any way the parser wants. And that introduces a huge problem for future understanding of this tree because we have two different parse trees. We, when we program, of course, in real life, you're not going to have these simple examples. You're going to have more complex. If you, for example, write a new programming language, you will say it's possible to write it this way, that way, and you can, you can forget about ambiguity. You can miss it in the code when you when you pro, when you define this grammar for the parser, which we will discuss today later. Then you can introduce the ambiguity. It happens a lot. To me, it happened many times. And then the parser and the parser may not tell you about this. That, that not the parser, the generator of the parser. So somebody will read your grammar, prepare everything, create a compiler for you, and the compiler will sort of work. But this ambiguity can introduce problems later because there are two different parse trees and you can understand them differently. What goes first, the B or the, or the, or the T? So what, was, what did the user mean? We don't know. Because we introduced the ambiguity here. How to catch it, how to understand the ambiguity? To me, as far as I know, it's an open question. So we cannot just, uh, by looking at it, uh, just say uh, uh, that this is ambiguous. In this case, we can because it's small. But if you look at the grammar, which is seven pages long, or maybe it's a description of a Java programming language, then it's 70 pages long. Then it's hard to, to say where is the ambiguity. So just remember that ambiguous grammar is a problem. That's one thing. And another problem is uh, so-called non-determinism. So let's put it this way. It's also another problem, also very big. So let's write it uh, this way. This is my grammar. And this is my text, and let's do it this way. Uh, maybe, I don't know, test. And this is my input. So this is, so far it's okay. It's even, this is even a regular grammar, right? It's very, it's type three. So everything is clean. We have only one time we mentioned this uh, non-terminal here. So it seems like very good well-written grammar, but let's look at the, at, the, at, the, at the text which is coming to us. Uh, for example, this test and then y. 
The parser starts from test. It finds that it suits the B. So it starts from here, it starts building the tree and says, B is fine. Uh, yeah, right. It, 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 it starts from the first rule. The parser starts from the first rule here. It looks here and it sees test. Test works fine. This is for B. So it's okay to, to, put it, to, to put the line here. So B is here expected. And then it tries to see the X, but it doesn't see the X. And it has to abandon the parsing here and start from scratch from this rule. So it started from the rule one, it applied it, it, it already said, okay, test works for me. The, 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 the word test is fine. I, I'm ready to continue. But then it realizes that there are X is coming there. So it has to do backtracking. It has to step one back, one step back. And again, start, okay, the rule number one is not good for me. Let's try the rule number two. And let's say this is not the X, but the Z. In this case, the Z will go. So it, it's going to try one rule, second rule, and only in the third rule, it can continue. And this process is called backtracking. And it may go quite far. In this primitive example, it goes just one small, just one non-terminal ahead and then returns back. But sometimes if you write the proper grammar, sometimes this backtracking may, uh, may cause uh, problems because it will go deeper, deeper, and deeper. And then it, at, at some point realize that it has to return back for a number of tokens. But usually these tokens are already consumed from the input stream. And that's, I don't know how they implement it internally. This is not, this is something we can probably investigate you can investigate, but um, that's a, that's a non-determinism, they call. So this is non-deterministic. So in this case, these three rules, we, don't, we cannot decide, the parser cannot decide when it stays at the beginning of the rules, the parser cannot decide which one to go because they all three look attractive. They start from B and B, we know it's, it's the word test. So all three rules are attractive and then non-deterministically, the parser will decide which way to go. That's why it's called non Determinism, non-determinism, and that's a that's a that's a sin. How to get rid of the non-determinism in this case? It's easy. We can just rewrite the rule like this: a, b, and put it c, and then say c, it's x or y or z. In this case, the parser will know. Okay, this is just two rules. I mean, there are here not two rules. There's there are four rules here, as we know. So technically, there are four rules. We say C is X, C is Y, and C is Z. So the parser will start from the rule, from the rule number one. It will find that B is okay. It will continue at the C, and here it will decide which one to go. But here it will be clear for the parser because already the word test is consumed. We forget. We can forget about it. We made a decision that the rule one is okay for us. We already jumped into this rule, and we can. We don't need to make. We don't need to step back anymore. We know that the rule number one is perfect for us. And then we make a decision between these two rules: either two, three, or four. Either the rule two, either three, or four. And this decision is also deterministic because we're staying now, not here, but we're staying here now, and we know exactly the decision is deterministic. So to refactor this grammar into this. It's called, uh, actually this mechanism is called left, left factoring. I didn't know about this name before I prepared this lecture, but some, it's, that's the name, left factoring. So they do, uh, they move probably, the name probably because we move this, these guys to the left. They were standing, you see, they were staying on the right side of the rules, and we're trying, we're moving it to the left side. The closer they are to the left, the easier for the parser to, to continue. Because the long rules are difficult for the parser. If something stays on the right side of the rule, the parser goes, 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 and then realize, boom, that's a mistake. So the parser goes back. Maybe this rule would be super difficult for the parser if we say A, and then we say something, I don't know, A, something T, and then some, I don't know, X, and then some B, and then finally we say, I don't know, F. And the parser, and the text is A, T, 7, B, uh, 4. So the parser will go, boom, okay, 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 and then not okay. And the parser should go back, 
backtrack for one, two, three, four, four steps back. That's difficult. So that's why the shorter the rule, the easier for the parser. The parser doesn't need to roll back when it happens. So I will show you the real code in the language which is called, you will tell me what's the name of the language. Look at the parser which I created myself actually two months ago. And the parser is a parsing the text which is, which looks like, uh, let me show you. You see my screen, right? So the idea was to, by the way, what is the language? Who knows this language? I'm sure nobody. Right, that's Perl. That's the language. It's really. <laughs> okay, did you see it on the corner or just know the language? Right. So this is really legacy language. I mean, it's used now, but uh, it's, uh, it's at the same time pretty legacy. And extremely, it was extremely difficult for me to learn this language. I just started to learn it about three or maybe four months ago. And that was very difficult because it sometimes, I mean, for example, in order to uh, get the uh, how many elements are in the array. So let's say you have the array, which is called A. So in order to get the count of the element, first of all, there are about five or six methods to do this. To, count, to count the elements of the array. How I do it is this. This is the way you get the number of elements in the array. So to count the elements of the array, this is how you do it. And that was, the first months it was difficult for me to, I would just, I just believed, I took it from Stack Overflow, I just believed that's the way it is, but then I realized how it works. Actually when you Perl internally, when you use the array, this is the array, and then you say plus zero, then it converts the array automatically into scalar, into a number. And when it converts the array to a number, it converts it to the number of elements of the array. So that's how crazy it is. And that's why plus zero makes it plus zero. So you, you, you add zero to, you understand what happened, right? But it was not clear to me. I just copied it and used it everywhere and then realized. Anyway, so this is a, a self-made parser without any formal grammar, just I told you, without any formal definition. And it parses the text which you see on the right. So who knows what, what is the format on the right? Biptech, that's right. So this is the format for scientific... It's also written. <laughs> Okay, so that's the format how you, if you write a scientific paper or diploma or whatever you write, then you probably will need the BIPTECH. So that's how you uh, specify the, uh, specify uh, who you refer to. So that's the author of the book, the title of the book, the year, uh, the publisher, and, and so on and so forth. And this may have a number of such uh, records without any, without any separation here could be like this, could be like this, it could be like this, so any space is anywhere, and you can do, uh, you can do this or you can do that. So that's the quite flexible format. In the beginning you say, uh, with this special sign, you say what type of the element is here. For example, it could be article, it could be book, it could be something. Then you give a unique name of how you name this, uh, this reference in your library, and then you specify who wrote this book, the author, the title, the year, and could be anything here. You can even say like this. So whatever. So it's not syntactically, all of that is correct. So now what I wanted to create, I wanted to create a parser of this format in order to check the quality of these references. So I was interested to make, because, because we, we usually make mistakes in these documents. For example, we sometimes forget to put the, the comma here, or we sometimes forget to, to capitalize the name of the guy, or we some, sometimes forget to, or sometimes we write the, the year incorrectly like this. So people make mistakes. So I made a, a style checker for this format. So I, I need to scan this document and then make decisions of uh, what's right, what's wrong. So this is how it works. I wanted to show you just briefly. I have a few more minutes. So what it does, it, it takes letter by letter from the input text. So this is the entire input text, all of it. So it takes letter by letter, one, two, three, four, scanning. Scanning, this is how you do it in, in, in Perl, by the way. You say four, and then you define the variable pause, and then you take these positions from zero to the, the entire length of the document. 
And then you take the first character, not the first, but the character by this position. So in Perl, you cannot just iterate the characters in the, in the string. You do it just like this. You iterate the, the, the position counter, and then you take the character. And then it's a huge look. This is the four. So basically, the entire scanning is just going character by character, one by one by one. And then after I get the character, there's a huge if. If, else, else, read the code. Else, 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 until the end. So I'm doing the decision. I'm making the decision of the character. You see, it's a huge, uh, huge decision making if. And I see if the character equals something, if, else, if, else, if. So first, I see if the character is space, then I just ignore the Y space. If the character is, I don't, I don't do any decisions here. So if the character is space, I just ignore it. Then if the character equals to the new line, then I just increment the line counter for the future and also ignore the end of line. Then I see else if, and here's the interesting state. Who knows about uh, finite state, finite state machines? You probably studied that, right? So this is sort of, we're going to discuss them a bit later, next lecture, but this is sort of like an artificial, artificially created state machine uh, automata. So it, in, the, in the variable s, it maintains the information about where we are right now in the document. So top means we just started. Top means the starting point. In our grammar, it's, that would be the program. So I call it top. So top, it means that we're staying here and we just got the first character. So it says, if the character is this, so we got it, then it switches the state to the start. So we know, okay, we started the new, the new block. We started a new block and this is an accumulator. So in the accumulator, we, we clean it up. So accumulator is something which will accumulate the, the content, which will be needed when we exit the state, the, when we exit the state. Or else we say the warning and we jump further. We say each beep tech entry must start with blah, 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 blah. What is this? So if it doesn't find staying on the top, it doesn't find this character and it just says I'm an error. And then else if character is a small capital, a small letter, English letter, and the state where we are equals to start, you remember start, so we switch to the start. So we're staying at this character, we switch to the, to the situation, to the state, which can be called start. And then in case we are okay, we understand it's an article. And again, we don't do anything. We just know, we just continue scanning. And so on and so forth. So every time we compare the character with what's coming and we check what is the state, where we are. Again, compare the character and check the state. Compare the character and check the state. So that's without any formal definition of the grammar, but, but it's inside. I believe that if I would need to describe it formally, then I would describe it. But here I am just doing it step by step and it does pre, does pretty good job and works and understands this in this form. And it's in Perl. A long if, long if, else, if, else, if, else. If in the end it's a warning if I didn't find, I didn't understand what's going on. So I, I checked all the possible, uh, all the possible uh, ways out of the state to another state and uh, nothing is found, so if it's a, that's an error. If everything is okay, I accumulate the character. So every time I move, so, so when I move character by character through the text, I understand them, uh, I, I, I read them and I, I do two things. I either, actually three things. I either change the state, we're in the beginning, we're inside the block, or we're inside the field, or we're inside the text block. We just move the, in this automata, we just move from state to state. And second, I accumulate what I read. So I don't just read the, the character and throw it away. I put it into accumulator. And then at some point when I see that the state is changing and I have in my accumulator what was read there. For example, here I start, I start at this point and I see A is okay. So I'm in this, here I'm in the state top. Then I switch to the state start. And I start reading A, R, T, I, C, L, E, and then boom, I meet this character. It means time to change the state, time to go to another state, which is, it was start, but now it is, uh, it is body, I think. 
something like this. Yeah, it is body. So here the state will be body. But when I switch to body, I have the, the, the word article in the accumulator. And I save this word to, in this line, I take this word, I, I, I remove the, the first character, which is at, and I save it to the, uh, to the, to the storage where I accumulate the information. So I need this accumulator and I clean it up. Accumulator is clean again and I go into the body. So that's basically the most primitive way of implementing a parser without using uh, parser generators, which we'll discuss in the next lecture. So people usually don't do it. It's really a hack. So usually normal people don't implement it like this because it's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's not so easy to maintain. Because here you have no formal, you don't see any formal rules. It's difficult to, to change it. So if tomorrow you will jump into this project, you will have a hard time understanding what's going on. If, but I knew that the format is there for ages and nobody will change it ever. So it was pretty safe to write it just one. And it's very simple. It's extremely simple. So I write it like this, which, is, which was my first experience of writing uh, scanners like that. Because usually I write it differently, which I will show you at the next lecture.